Escape from Mount Moriah. This is a book by Jack Inglehard. I've done a tribute before on this book. Read a little bit from the beginning of it. I read a little from the uh, descriptions on the back and the introduction. This time I'd like to read the whole story of my father Joe. Here's my little book marker which gives an advertisement for some of the part of my life that supports reality for me. So I'll read uh, the first story in this book that was made into a film by Nikila Cole and her people. The story is titled, My Father Joe. I'll try to read it without stumbling around too much. I just wanted to pay tribute to this. I think the book is special enough and the story is that it deserves the little bit of extra attention that I'm wanting to give it. My Father Joe. Now we had it good. Six million never made it out. We, we escaped. We escaped France when the Nazis and their gendarmes were beginning their roundups in our district in Toulouse. We walked the Pyrenees, hid in Spain, rested in Portugal, and found refuge in Montreal, Canada. Much later, we moved to America. Amazing how so much can be summed up in a single paragraph. And life as we know it is not lived by the paragraph. Take my word for it that our escape was a tremendous adventure. Two years of running, evading, a hundred close calls in cars, trains, ships, a thousand moments of doubt, fear, helplessness, and being spooked at every turn by the sights and sounds of Nazi boots. But I won't go into all that. That's another book. And frankly, it's a story that's already been written by others, even cheapened and trivialized. And to tell the truth, unless you've lived it, you'll never know. But maybe I can share with you what it was like being a refugee. As for my father, and so much of this story is about my father, let me say that he was no ordinary man. He was a man of great learning. He knew Torah, Talmud, Mishnah, Kabbalah, all of which had been crammed into him as a yeshiva boy in Poland. He was also a man of action. When he found out that we were on the list, no words of caution from my mother could detain him. He knew just what to do. Now here we were in Montreal. My father was a businessman. Like Rockefeller was a rabbi, so was my father a businessman. He tottered from failure to failure, but with pride. He was his own man. He used to say, I don't know what it is with me. I can't work for another man. This was no weakness in his eyes. No, it was strength, a sign of character. To which my mother would say, yes, a character you are. But for a spell, my father did work for another man, and Mr. Snow was his name. Mr. Snow was a handbag manufacturer. He had a factory on St. Lawrence Street, where he employed 25 workers, designers, cutters, and sewers. In Europe, my father had had a handbag factory of 40 workers, or 50, or 60, or maybe 100. The number grew along with my father's wrath, for he did not like working for Mr. Snow. 
so he'd come home and say, he calls himself a fabricant. I had a factory of 50, and he's going to teach me about handbags? The next day it was a factory of 60, and so on. My father was a designer for Mr. Snow. Father designed handbags with frames, followed the European, the classic European fashion, and the style that had made him revered in the trade. Now he'd bring home his designs for my mother's review, designs which Mr. Snow had rejected again and again. Mr. Snow, you see, had no faith in handbags with frames. Frames were out. Zippers were in. Zippers, my father said. In time, though, he stopped being contemptuous, and he stopped bringing home his designs. Gradually, he fell into one of his great trance-like silences. Mother would ask him how things were going in the factory, and he'd say, Good enough. She'd ask him why he stopped bringing home samples. He'd respond by staring off in the distance. And I never knew what he saw there except Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He lived more in their world than in his own. Naturally, one day, he forgot his lunch bag. Go bring this to your father, my mother said. I walked past the St. Lawrence Street grocery stores, butcher shops, kosher bosher, bakeries, and everything that was retail and wholesale. Further up, factories had been turned into tenements, tenements into factories. And in such a place, wrapped from top to bottom, worked my father. Approaching the landing, you could hear the roar of sewing machines. Closer, you smelled the adhesives and the leather. Inside, I did not know where to begin. Cutters were bent over huge tables, slicing up giant stretches of animal hides. Sewers were grinding in frenzy, never once gazing up, as though somewhere in their urgency of livelihood. They had lost the human sense of wonder and curiosity. For the most part, these were Jewish refugees who were paid by the peace, but the rush of their machines were like whales. These people were in a hurry to forget the past and catch up to the present. The designers, the nobility of the handbag factory, where were they? There I'd find my father. I stepped into the stockroom where rough talking characters were packing finished handbags into cardboard boxes. These types had a word and a look for everybody. I heard them yell, Joe, where's my coat? Then they'd laugh. There must be an errand boy here, I thought, named Joe. Every place has a Joe. I heard others in the factory take up the same chant, Joe, Joe, where's my coat? This Joe, some joke he must be. Then I saw my father. He was carrying a tray of cokes, but not moving fast enough. Over here, Joe, at a boy. How, I wondered, does a man go from Noah, Ben, Jacob, to Joe? My father would have had the answer, but I would never ask. The next story, you probably want to. Read all of these. I recommend them, of course. Penn Station. That's a story about his mother. And it's very, just all these are very sensitive and worth a read. This is how we treat people who escape a monster like Hitler. Joe, where's my coke? A child. <laughs>